Am I heard? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us here tonight and thank you those who are watching us right now online. Uh, my name is Marina Gear, and I'm part of the team here at Silicon Valley Innovation Center, the company that is hosting this event tonight. Apart from uh, speaker series events, we also organize executive uh, programs uh, in innovation and emerging trends and workshops. And this May, we start organizing conferences. And our first conference is coming up on May 21st. And I ha have here my colleague, Natalie Wood, who will tell you a couple more words about it. So we're beginning a new conference series on emerging trends and innovation in emerging trends in disruptive technologies. And um, we're going, the first one we're starting is called Data Alchemy, and it's going to be on emerging trends around predictive analytics, uh, for predictive analytics for marketing, for sales, for finance. And it's not really for data analysts, it's for business people. So um, if you're interested in uh, attending, we're happy to give you a discount to attend. It'll be in person and also online. And also if you um, have an expertise in uh, predictive analytics, predictive modeling, um, please uh, give Marina maybe after uh, the event uh, your card. And uh, if you also know anything about sponsorships, uh, we have quite a great uh, speaker lineup. So that's really about it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, and now, uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Ben Parr, uh, who is an award-winning journalist, entrepreneur, investor, and now expert on attention. He is the co-founder and managing director of Dominate Fund, a venture capital firm. Uh, he was co-editor and editor-at-large uh, of Mashable, where he wrote 2,400 articles on social media and technology over what period of time? <laughs> Over three and a half years. Okay, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> he also managed uh, Mashable's editorial team. Uh, he served as columnist and commentator for CNET and was named one of the top 10 tech journalists in, uh, in the world by Say Media and named, the top, uh, named uh, to the Forbes 30 under 30. Uh, this sounds like a lot of accomplishment. Uh, well, Ben, thank you very much for joining us, for being our guest speaker, and congratulations on your book release. Mm, thank you. Uh, before we start talking about the book, I just wanted to uh, ask you to tell a little bit uh, about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you are from the Midwest. Uh, how did you end up moving to Silicon Valley in the first place? Oh, that's an interesting story. So let's see. Graduated from Northwestern in Chicago, 2008. And I worked with my entrepreneurial mentors. Um, at the time, uh, my mentors are Mark Ackler, who was uh, who's the founder of Math Ventures in Chicago and used to be the SVP of Redbox, and Troy Heinikoff, who now runs Techstart Chicago. And I worked with them. My very first job was building Facebook applications. Not like the cool ones, like <laughs> the really old looking ones that make you feel like we actually made use these things. And I don't know if you remember back then, but they had like these things where you could like grow plants out of eggs on your profile and you could like just stick random things. It was like almost MySpace. And we made this one called F Friend Quilts. And it was actually kind of cool. You could mosaic your, like, create mosaics of your friends and memories. So you could just put in a bunch of pictures and a bunch of videos. And it would be this mosaic as a dedication maybe to a game or to a birthday or to an anniversary. Um, but it was too hard to use. And so, like, it was too hard to use in the sense that you had to upload the picture individually every time. And just, you know, we never really took off. Although, weirdly enough, there was, like, an entire segment of Arizona that used it nonstop. And I don't know why. But after that, I joined my mentor, Mark, at a web health company to help uh, kickstart it, but that wasn't really my interest. And during that Chicago winter, that was like the worst winter I went there. I'm born, raised in Illinois. And basically, like one morning, I opened up the door and I'm like, hmm, snow's up to my crotch. I'm leaving. 
And so at the same time around then, I had uh, started doing some more writing. My personal site on, I'd hit dig on my personal site and a few others. And then I got recommended for Mashable. Just a like, part-time writer, they paid you. I think they literally paid me $15 an article. That was okay back then. And I'm like, all right, sure, why not? My stuff went viral. And somewhere around like Mar February, March, like, it's like I had to move. And around that time, Mashable learned that. And they're like, you should just join us full-time as an editor. And I'm like, only if I can move to Silicon Valley. And funny enough, back then, Mashable had no presence in Silicon Valley. There was nobody. There was The editor-in-chief was in Virginia, in Maryland. The CEO, Mr. Pete Cashmore, was in Scotland at the time. The COO was in New York. The chief reporters were in Atlanta and San Diego. And so you're like, Mashable, which was purely tech and social media at the time, I was like, I I'll do that. So I moved. I moved in with what are actually now two my two partners on the Dominate Fund. And we just, like it just kind of exploded. And, you know, when I first moved, you know, I was the only master reporter. So when somebody needed to interview Mark Zuckerberg, it was me. When somebody needed to go to a press conference, it was me. When somebody needed to do anything, it was me. That was a good way to start my career. I was very, very lucky. Yeah, that sounds like a great way. Uh, and now you moved from journalism to the investment side. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to be more hands-on. There's two reasons. The first reason is basically that I burned out, honestly. After writing, what, 2,400 articles for a long? I just like doing that. I like playing with this every once in a while. PK here knows I do that. Uh, every once, at, no, just after writing for three and a half years, I kind of burned out. I didn't start going into journalism in college. I actually studied science and human culture and political science and business. And I wanted to do more entrepreneurship stuff and build more companies. But... Um, it just got to a point where I needed to move on and I really burned out. I mean, the other thing why, it, like, the thing I've learned is that a lot of the skill sets that you have for investing are kind of the same as the skill sets you have for, uh, are the kind of the same skill sets that you have for journalism, you know? It's about meeting lots of people, analyzing hundreds if not thousands of companies, uh, and analyzing and understanding different markets, building relationships. They're the same thing in both worlds. And the difference with investing is it's much more hands-on and you get to work with more companies. And I find it very fascinating and interesting and I'm happy I made that switch. Cool, and I know that your work with the Dominant Fund made you uh, interested in doing this research uh, on attention. Uh, is this your first book? It is my first book and, oh man, was it hard. <laughs> and actually, yeah, I, my, my next question um, is, as I see it, it's very different to write an article, even a long one, uh, and to write a book. Uh, so uh, what was your method of writing this book? Can you share a little bit with us your uh, routine, daily routine? Did you lock yourself in a room and uh, wrote two pages, made yourself write two pages a day? Or, uh, I don't know, did you uh, drink uh, tons of coffee? Or, or did you use the Hemingway's approach instead or something else? <laughs> I wish I could have written two pages a day. It's especially for a nonfiction book that has so much scientific research. And um, for those, I see some of you have the book, and thank you. You'll find that the it, there's a lot of scientific research that went into it. I went through a thousand research studies. I interviewed dozens of PhDs. Uh, my the hard the hardcore method of actually writing it. Most of it was done in two in two stints, and I did the first stint in the mountains near Mount Shasta on the river. And it was gorgeous, and uh, this um, amazing uh, lawyer gave me his place to use for two months, uh, like a month and a half, uninterrupted. So I was just there all alone. I'd like, I'd basically, I'd wake up, I'd cook in the morning, I'd start writing, uh, I'd like make tea, I'd keep writing, I'd go on a walk, I'd keep writing, I'd do some quick workouts, I'd keep writing, and my amount of social interaction in those two months was pretty much zero. And then my second and final stint was actually in Thailand, because um, I have a, I'm a Thai citizen. I have a place in Thailand, and so I went to there. And I cannot say that was a bad thing. That was quite nice to be able to write there. But I finished a lot of the book there, a lot, about a month and a half as well. The thing I've learned, especially with something as intensive as a book, is that you just need to, like, no, you can't have meetings. You've got to get away from everybody. Especially in Thailand, I was be able to say, can't have a meeting. I'm not in your time zone, and I'm nowhere near you. 
Sounds like a dream come true. Now I want to write a book as well. <laughs> uh, let you, me, you, let you, me think you, about it. You say that, and then you'll actually start writing the book, and it'll be pain and torture. Oh, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Uh, so for your book, you interviewed 50 visionaries. Is that right? About, about around 50 people, around yeah. Around 50 people, including Sheryl Sandberg, CEO mm. of uh, Facebook. Um, uh, what were your criteria for picking those people? Uh, was it their personalities, their work, or your personal maybe interest in what they do? It was it was actually diversity. I wanted to interview people from different m industries and walks of life. Like the first is the PhDs. I interviewed a lot of researchers, and I needed to get the uh, a lot of their research in this book. And so those interviews really helped encapsulate like the which those key triggers of the book. And then I kind of went through who are the people that really emphasized these triggers. And some of them were people, you know, I've been friends with for years where I knew, like Cheryl or Steven Soderbergh, I had known for a long time. And But others, I just, you know, either I get introductions or just reach out or something randomly happened, you know? Like, I just random, like, like I got a random e in email from David Copperfield, and I'm like, all right, let's do this. But it was a, it was a variety, because David Copperfield's magic and performance, Cheryl Sandberg, business and women, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Super Mario on gaming, or I interviewed street violinists, and I interviewed media execs. I tried to interview the broadest spectrum I possibly could to get the broadest sense of attention possible. Because it wasn't, I didn't write the book as just for entrepreneurs. I wrote it for business people. I wrote it for teachers. I wrote it for you know parents who need the attention of their kids, for musicians who need the attention of fans and and agents and managers. Uh, then. Uh my logical next question is, I know that you interviewed Mark Zuckerberg for one of your articles. Are there any stories that you care to share with us about interviewing him? Uh, and uh, my follow-up question would be, is he good at attracting people's attention? I th Zuckerberg's become better at personally directing attention. Zuckerberg's obviously built a very attention-grabbing product, and there's a lot of the science I talk about in the book, why that is. Uh, personally, him himself, he's had this kind of amazing progression over the years. He, the first time I interviewed, he w interviewed him. He was very, um, he paused a lot. He did. He was. He was. You know. He was kind of comfortable around me because he'd already known me a little bit. But he was still like, like not on point as maybe he is now. He's very on point now. If you do an interview with him, he knows exactly what he wants to say and how to say it. He's not nervous at all. Um, I do remember one time I interviewed him, and it was in one of the, like, a couple of Facebook offices ago, and they had, like, a uh, glass room, and I was sitting with him and uh, about two other execs, and he was just, like, playing around with his boomerang, and he's just, like, I don't know where he got this, like, it's a real, like, Australian boomerang, and I'm, like, can we just, like, go outside and, like, throw the boomerang around instead? He was so tempted. He wanted to so badly. He had, like, there was, like, a line of, like, six other reporters who want to interview, who were going to interview Zuck, and I'm like, we should just go throw a boomerang around. Because how often do you throw a boomerang around? I bet you most of you probably haven't even thrown a boomerang in your life. A real one. Not like one of those toy ones, a real one. That was during uh, the interview? He had, no, he just had it in his hand. It was, like, fiddling around. I got to play with it. But, like, we, I wanted to just go outside and throw the boomerang with him. But we never got to do that. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance uh, someday. Um, so my next question is then, uh, what is the most interesting person you've ever interviewed in your life? The most interesting person I've ever interviewed in my life? That's a long, that's a long amount of time, for me at least. Uh, there were, I mean, a lot of the most interesting interviews I've ever done really were for the book, you know? Like, uh, interviewing both Shigeru Miyamoto and David Copperfield. Those are two that really stand out to me. Um, so the creator of Super Mario, I got to interview him in Los Angeles at E3. And he's just this very fascinating, childlike character with so much knowledge. And I, he could he could understand my English, and he could speak English, but he also had the translator, which was unique. But he was just telling me these stories of how he created Super Mario and how he created a Pikmin and the kind of things he was trying, the emotions he was trying to convey and why he thinks Mario became popular. Like, one fun example, in, in like, back when they first created Super Mario, they had huge limitations. It was, you could only design characters in the 16 by 16 pixels. And so, when they wanted to make Mario distinctive on the background, capture attention, they only had that amount of space. So how do you make a character distinctive on there? Well, they gave him a big nose, because it was the only way to tell he had a nose. And they're like, it looks weird with just a big, like, long nose thing. So they gave him a mustache so that you could see it. 
And they're like, it's very hard to do hair when you have 16 by 16 pixels. So they gave him a red cap. And then finally, you like you could barely tell like a shirt was different than pants. So they gave him the overalls. And so that's why Super Mario has the overalls, the cap, the nose, and the mustache. But, you know, it also had that conversation about why people love Mario. And it's a combination of the fact that there's this amazing gameplay game to game where you know, like, it's just long enough to keep your interest. Well, it's just short enough to keep your interest, but long enough to be challenging each level. And you can go on each level and you want to complete the whole game. And then it's also that people identify with the characters in Super Mario and they care about, you know, Koopas or Mario Kart Racing. And, like, the fact that Mario is kind of an everyman in the sense that he's not Superman. You don't, you're, he's not Ripley with muscles. You can project yourself on him, especially since he does not talk. And so you can project a little bit of yourself on Mario and you can care about Mario and his universe. Uh, David Copperfield um, is, the thing about him is that he is always, no more than anybody I've ever met or probably will ever meet, is thinking about how everybody perceives the performance more than anybody else. Every little detail matters to him. He can see and figure out how are people going to react to certain actions, certain words, or certain things. So if the first time you, met, you meet him, you could think of him maybe as potentially difficult because he's asking for specific things. But when you realize is that he's just really thinking about how to give the best performance for his audience, no matter where or when. He's all about delighting his audience, and he's really thoughtful about it. And I had the chance to interview him on stage at a conference in Las Vegas, and he's just fun. He's just like a good guy. Cool, great examples. Uh, another another example of uh, someone who uh, is very good at delighting their audiences are the Kardashians. How would you explain their <laughs> phenomenon? I, I had to ask this question, really. Of course you did. <laughs> so I talk in the book. So the book's divided into seven key psychological triggers that capture attention. And one of those triggers is acknowledgement. It's the last chapter of the book. It's about the fact that we pay attention to the people and things that pay attention to us and provide us with validation, empathy, and understanding. And so uh, one interesting study that kind of shows this for me, it's kind of actually kind of cruel, is I, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I got to go through this. Uh, they strapped electrodes to the ankles of married women to see how much pain they would feel in different conditions. And they had three conditions. Condition one, the, women were, the married women were alone. Condition two, the married women could hold the hand of a stranger. In condition three, the married women could hold the hand of their husbands. And so what they found was that the women... I'm not sure where this is going. <laughs> I'm going to get there. I just like this story, too, even though it's kind of cruel. Uh, it is cruel. The women, the women who, didn't ha who didn't have anyone to hold the hand of, they felt the most pain. They had nowhere to direct their attention. And the women who felt the least pain were the ones who were with, who ha were with, the mar who were with their husbands. But what I loved or what was the most interesting thing to me was that there was a direct correlation between the strength of the marriage and how much pain the women felt like if they had a strong marriage it was so powerful that they could feel almost no pain from these electrodes strapped to their feet and this is the power of I talk about acknowledgement of how we pay attention to those people and now getting into the celebrity culture part part of the reason we pay attention to celebrities is because they provide us with that same validation and acknowledgement. They provide us with identity. And so it says something about you if you're a fan of Taylor Swift or you're a fan of Sheryl Sandberg or you're a fan of Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian represents to me this kind of uh, segment of society that wants to be famous, that cares about fame. And they actually talk about in the book the research behind fame. The reason we want to be famous is not because we want to be powerful or we want to be rich. Most of the research actually shows and is that we want to be famous because we think it is the quickest way to uh, belong, to feel belongingness, to be accepted by others. And this is especially for children what they believe. And it is the reason why children ages 8 to 11, it's the number one thing when you ask them, like, what do you want to have when you grow up is, like, fame. It's a very, very big thing for them, but it's because they think that they're, everyone will like them suddenly. And that's why. And so it's that kind of belongingness. And I feel like there's a lot of that element in the Kim Kardashian fan base. You think about the game, her very, very, very popular mobile game. What is it about? It's about becoming famous. It's about getting accepted by others. It's about having, it's about being a belonging by getting to the very top of the celebrity A-list. That's what Kim Kardashian represents to me. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, actually, now, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your book uh, and uh, 
you know, I really like the title. I think it's both very creative and concise. Oh, well, when I lived in New York a couple of years ago, I worked for a PR agency called Attention. I think it's... I know them. Oh, great. I think you, you may have worked with my friend Yuna back then. Uh, yes. You yes. know Yuna. I know Yuna. <laughs> of course, I know Yuna. Hi, Yuna. <laughs> we'll have to go say hi to Yuna after this. We will. We'll. Uh, so I think it's a great name as well, but yours is obviously way more sophisticated. So how did you come up with this uh, word cap typology? Was it a like revelation type of thing, or did you uh, brainstorm it for a while? Well, this one night, you know, I was stripping at the strip club, and <laughs> I cannot tell the rest of that story. No, you know. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Just wait until a little bit later. Uh, you know, it's I, I've had that title since the very beginning. And you go through a lot of iterations with titles, and you go through a lot of back and forth, but that always had to stay the title, you know. Um, it just, I wanted to have a, I wanted to define a word, and I wanted a word that represented both attention and science, and that this was not just, this was, this is not a marketing book. It'll help you with marketing, but it's not a marketing book, and it's not a, uh, you know, it's not an entrepreneurship book. It is a, it is at its core, you know, a scientific book. It is using real science to capture real attention regardless of what you do. And so this was the word. And I can't imagine what other word or words I could have used. I try sometimes and I'm like, there's nothing else. It's, that's just what the title is. That's what the universe told me it had to be. I had no choice. Without going into too many details, because we obviously want to keep your readers intrigued, what is the book about? I mean, at the core, it's about the science and the psychology of attention and why we pay attention to certain people and products and how to utilize that science to capture the attention of others. It presents a new model of understanding of how attention works. And I go through what I call the three stages of attention and understanding those three stages and how you walk your audience through them. And then I talk about what I call the seven captivation triggers, and those are seven psychological triggers that capture attention across all those stages, regardless of culture, regardless of industry, they're universal in human nature. And I talk about why these triggers work and how they capture attention scientifically, and then how you, those are already utilized in uh, by today's masters of attention and how you can utilize them. Um, among those seven captivation triggers, are there, can you name like two, three most important ones? They're all important, but I'll, t I'll talk about a couple different ones. Um, so uh, I go, I, they go kind of in chronological order. And for me to actually explain, can I explain this three stages of attention quickly? Absolutely, yeah, it's your event. So there's three stages of attention in my model. There's immediate attention, there's short attention, and there's long attention. I'm going to apologize for what I'm about to do. Um, so the first stage is immediate attention. It's this immediate subconscious and automatic reaction we have to certain sight sounds and stimuli. It's the kind of reason why, for example, if someone ha has a gun, it takes a gun, shoots in the air, we pay attention, or if someone does this, <laughs> you pay attention. You look beautiful with all that. <laughs> I apologize for that because it makes a mess, but it gets my point across very clearly. There's an automatic reaction, and the reason you do this automatic reaction is because you have to protect yourself. It's a defense mechanism. Imagine if you had to think every time a car was coming towards you. We'd be a dead human species. But then you go to the second stage, which is when it comes conscious. That is short attention. That's our short-term interest in something. That's when you're concentrating on a speaker or you're concentrating on a TV show or a movie or something else. And that's uh, when you switch to the consciousness. And then the final stage is long attention. That's our long-term interest in something. That's when we start... Uh, you know, not just listening to a Beyonce song on the radio, but we actually buy her entire collection or go to her concert. It's the difference between, you know, buying your first Apple product and standing in line for the next, the Apple watch. And so you, what I talk about is walking through those three stages and the psychological and the brain mechanisms that actually control each of these stages and how they work. Now, when it comes to the actual triggers, different triggers capture attention at different stages. For example, a trigger that really focuses on immediate attention is one called automaticity. And that's our automatic reaction to certain sights, sounds, symbols, colors, especially colors. Like, for example, um, let's see if anyone gets this right. If you are a hitchhiker in the side of the road and you want to have the best chance of being picked up, what color shirt should you wear? Red, yellow, anyone else? 
black, white. Someone <laughs> always, there's always someone who says no shirt, and I or, or can tell exactly who that person is and what that person's about. You're going streaking Oops. later after a couple beers. <laughs> I should like have a, like a ward for them or something. The streaker's crown. So the answer is actually gender specific. If you're a man, most bright colors will work. because Yellows, oranges, reds, because of the contrast they have with, look at the road. What color is it? Dark brown, gra like blacks, grays, greens, browns. Bright colors stand out against that. Now, if you're a woman, there was actually a French scientist who says, I'm going to go study this. And so he had women wear different colored shirts and uh, tested this scientifically. And he found on average about, you know, they, uh, people would pull over about 13% of the time unless they wore the color red, in which case it went to 23% of the time. And that's actually because of our subconscious associations with red and romanticism. In fact, if you just put, for anyone who uses Tinder here, if you put a thick red border around a person's face, the opposite gender will rate that person as more attractive than if it was not there. And these little subconscious cues really actually do capture attention. And so it's about uh, the contrast something has and its associations. For example, Amazon, what button, what color do there, are their buy buttons? Yellow and orange, because they have high contrast with gray and white backgrounds. However, those two colors actually have the lowest correlation with competence. And so if someone walked in with a yellow or orange suit, think about it. You'd probably laugh your ass off. Make no sense at all. And that correlation sticks. It's actually part of the reason why the cover is the blue and teal, because blue has the highest correlation with competence. So that's one trigger. Um, another trigger that really matters is the disruption trigger. And that's when people pay attention to things that violate their expectations. And that's the sort of thing that happens when, uh, you know, it was shock advertising or, you know, I like examples. Like PK and I are sitting at a, at, at a coffee shop and a giant clown comes and sits down next to us. We're going to pay attention, right? But the reason why is because we make another threat assessment tool. You'll find attention is a lot about threat assessment. We make a threat assessment of, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is this positive or negative? Maybe it's our friend who's going to visit a children's hospital. Or maybe it's a guy who's about to mug us. We don't know. It's out of place. We have to figure it out. And this comes from our hunter-gatherer backgrounds. Because when we saw something out of place in, in past history, it was most likely going to be something like a saber-toothed tiger or potential food. And so those same mechanisms we still use, but we don't have saber-toothed tigers to worry about. So we apply it in different contexts. It's the reason why, you know, like I said before, shock advertising and some of these other things really capture attention. Um, those are two I'll start with. I'm sure I'll talk about more uh, throughout the day. Yeah, so automaticity and uh, dis disruption, disruption, right? And... Um, mm, how do you actually choose which trigger to use and in what situation? Can you give an example? Well, the thing about the triggers is I kind of order them in terms of how of I order them in terms of like the stages you have to capture attention in. You know, like automaticity is great for short attention, while uh, while disruption is great. Automaticity for immediate attention and disruption for short attention. And I talked a little bit about acknowledgement. That's a great tool for long attention. Uh, and so it kind of matters what kind of attention are you trying to grab and why, you know? If you're trying to create a campaign, if you're getting a startup and you're just trying to get it out there, a disruption trigger can work really well. And the framing trigger, which is how you frame and frame a message so that your audience is more receptive to it, really matters. But if you're trying to capture long-term attention, get people to come back to the table, then things like the acknowledgement trigger and the mystery trigger, which is that we pay attention to incomplete storylines and incomplete thoughts, and there's a lot of science behind that. We pay attention to that. So it really just kind of depends. What is your goal? A lot of times you're going to use multiple ones on the same campaign or same idea or whatever you're trying to get attention for. Okay. Um, so you mentioned yourself that uh, your uh, strategy is uh, good for almost anyone working, uh, for many people across uh, working across different industries. What makes your uh, approach so universal? <laughs> I mean, it's because the psychology is universal. We, there are, there, you know, there are d differences culture to culture. For example, you know, uh, green will have a different impact in different cultures. You don't wrap your packaging in green in China because it has associations with death. And actually, I remember Revlon used a, um, used one, did a perfume in the U.S. that did well. It was like out of the camellia flower or something. And then they decided to expand, and they expanded to South America. 
but they didn't realize, and they didn't think about this for some goddamn reason, that the flower is actually used in funerals in South America. And so they were literally giving their customers the smell of death. I mean, how often do you want to smell like death? And so it's uh, <laughs> it, it's it's those associations. Where were we at the moment? We're talking about there are probably right. a lot of this culture relevant. Uh, oh yes, there we go. Things. So like that the it, but the psychology of it itself is universal. You know, we all pay attention to disruptions because it's fundamental to our human wiring. We pay attention to acknowledgement because val getting validation from others and acknowledgement from others is also fundamental to our survival. And for example, I talk about rewards and that system works because every single human being has dopamine and has the dopamine loop. And so really the reason why it's universal is because the science, because we are, it's all based off the psychology and the science of human beings. There are obviously differences when it comes to certain things with the core of the triggers. I, they were, I picked them because they were universal across cultures. They were psychology and not cultural. I see, that makes sense. Um, talking about long-term attention, because uh, that's the one we all want to capture, right? Uh, I, uh, in your book, I read uh, about one great example, I think, uh, Beyonce's fifth album release in mm -hmm. 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, and you make a point that uh, the release was so successful, not only because she surprised her audience, releasing it exclusively on iTunes and uh, posting just one photo on Instagram uh, on, f on a Friday late night, but also because she invested years and years into nurturing her audience and preparing them. Uh, so does it mean that there is absolutely no way uh, without having such an audience to achieve an effortless, uh, effortless <laughs> success overnight? It, there example? is no such thing as overnight success. And anyone who thinks there's such a thing as overnight success, I mean... I'm sorry. I mean, there's short. Me the too. only there's only one type of overnight success, and it's called the lottery. And usually, everyone that does the lottery somehow spends it all. And like, it really is actually. If you read the stories, it's really bad. Actually, it's like a curse. I hope. No, oh, actually, I do still hope I win the lottery someday. I'm. Who am I lying about? But the. But it's it's you you hit, there is no such thing as a overnight success. You know. That's the bad news. Well, yeah, but it also means that putting in real work me gets real results. What, Pinterest took what? Three, four years before it actually took off? Angry Birds was the 49th game from Rovio. Like, they had 49 games before that game. Before they finally took off. 49! That's not an overnight success. So, uh, what Beyonce did, you know, she just, like, started small, and then you got Destiny's Child, and built an audience there, and kept building that audience, and kept validating that audience, and speaking with that audience, and doing concerts with that audience, and putting in the work, and doing that over the course of not just of years and years, a decade plus, has paid off for her, where she could finally, you know, put out an album and it would go platinum. She couldn't have done that, you know, five years ago, but she could do that now because she spent that time building long-term attention. And so, yes, it's the combination of capturing short-term attention for certain things, like an album release, or a book, or a product launch, but it's also about building that long-term community around somebody and something, about building that long-term validation. Beyonce has a huge community around her, and that's why we all buy. Uh, yeah, talking about that, um, so what do you think uh, can kill our attention? For example, I still uh, listen to her music and I follow her work, but I uh, gave up on my PhD thesis a while ago and uh, stopped doing my research. Oh, what, what's the difference? Well, one of them is easier than the other. Okay. Okay, the level of sophistication. Well, okay. that's a good question. Uh, it, it it just depends, you know? Like, um, one of the things is, like, with the reward trigger, for example, that we are really motivated by uh, intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. And the issue with maybe a PhD thesis is it takes a long time to reap the rewards of that. Oh, yes. A very long time. And at a certain point, you don't get that kind of short-term reward hit. The reason why um, social games and work really well is because they give you that constant short hit. Like, you've, succe you've succeeded. Here's something. Now here's a new task for you. That works a little bit better on the human psyche than very, very, very long tasks. Getting very, very long tasks done is really about intrinsic motivations, like it's purpose and self-mastery and that sort of thing. And it is a harder one to constantly keep validated because it's about 
like you pushing that. There's a, but there's a lot of other things that kind of uh, kill attention. When, uh, for example, uh, I think about news stories. And when there's a mystery in a news story, like when a plane goes down and no one can find the plane, people pay attention because they want to know what happened. And in fact, part of the reason that we pay attention to mysteries is because we dislike uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty in a storyline, we fill it with speculation so that we feel better. Because uncertain, the more uncertainty there is, the less comfortable we feel, and the more we feel like we have to finish a mystery. And so if you finish a mystery, a storyline, then the story drops if there's no mystery to it, if there's no interesting characters to it. You know, that's part of the reason why we'll watch a Jimmy Fallon or you know, interview with a notable figure because we know those names and we care about those names and we care what they think. And once you kind of, there's a lot of little things, you know. Um, it, it really kind of just comes down to is that story, like the compelling storylines versus the not compelling ones and whether or not we're getting that reward. That's just like a few of the little things I'm thinking about. Okay, I like the reward thing. It was obviously not my fault, just not enough re <laughs> rewards. No, of course not. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, you also write uh, in your book that in order to capture audiences' long attention, we need to create value. Do you have any specific advi advice on how to create that value? And maybe some examples? What kind of value are we talking about? Yeah, that's another question. What <laughs> kind of value are we talking about? Uh, I mean, the value really depends on your audience, right? And so one of the triggers is the framing trigger, talking about how... Uh, it's about the frame of reference of your audience and what is your audience looking for? And why, when is your audience most receptive to something? You know, for example, uh, it, like, if your audience, if you're talking to an audience at the NRA, you're not really providing them value if you get up there and you start talking about climate change. This is probably not going to be the audience right, that's right for you. You may literally be shot on stage. It'd be a new story. I'd pay attention to that story, but it wouldn't be the story you want to be a part of. Uh, so it's really about understanding the audience and what's really going to give them that value and then and providing that value and uh, delivering on that promise, you know? Um, one of the things I talk about, like, in the mystery trigger is that when a cliffhanger comes, you when you come, like, in a storyline, we expect when we come back for the next episode to have that promise delivered of you're going to tell us the answer to that storyline. But it's the same thing in general. Like if you're gonna, if you promise that you're going to do something for your customer and you don't do it, they're going to be pissed. They're going to pay negative attention because they're going to remember that because there's an incomplete task. But it's not going to be a very positive sort of thing. And so it's like to me, it's just understanding what is the thing that they truly value, and then providing that uh, and delivering on that promise. Yeah, I think that illustrates it pretty well, actually. Um, so you've been quite a well-known guy, <laughs> in the, especially in the tech industry, mm -hmm. and I wanted uh, to ask you, like, looking back at your career as a journalist, did you use any of those seven triggers, maybe intuitively, uh, you know, while writing your articles or attending events? All the time. So, <laughs> so I mean, you think about when, when we were titling articles, a lot of times when you're titling an article for a publication, you lead with the names that people know. You know, the problem with a lot of articles writing about startups is that no one knows who the hell these startups are. So writing an article like, uh, what's called Blue Goody Blue? Blue Goody Blue launches XDX product. Who gives a fuck? Because they don't know the names, they don't understand the context. But if you suddenly put in Mark Cuban backed Blue Goody Blue, suddenly people are going to read the article because of they know the names. There's actually, I call this the reputation trigger, and that we pay attention to reputable sources because it's an easy way for us to know whether something is worth our time and attention. Because if we hear that Mark Cuban and Dominic Fund and Jesus have invested in a startup, probably should pay attention to it. Also, if Jesus invests in a startup, that's going to be scary. Um, Jesus Ferguson. The <laughs> Who got that poker reference? The, the, so, like in Mashable time, I was like, you know, that we'd lead with things like Google, Facebook, or those key characters like Zuckerberg or a Cuban or something because people paid much more attention to it and thinking a little, like, a lot about those titles. And then when it came to the, you know, uh, a lot of times it was also the framing for our audience. So, one thing that we did early on with Mashable was we taught our audience how to use social media because it was so new, no one knew. I literally, you could find this article, it exists. I literally wrote the article, 20 Ways to Share a Blog Post. That was an article I wrote. I also wrote an article called How to Retweet. That was a thing. 
This was back before you could click the button. There was like you had to do the RT thing, and I had to teach people this. You, but, need, you need to start with something. But you think about it. We taught our audience how to do these two things, or in a bunch of other articles. And guess what was the first thing they shared? Mashable. And that started going viral because they would keep on sharing Mashable articles. They would use their newfound knowledge on our posts. And we taught them this like frame of reference of share. We, you're the audience that shares. Keep sharing. Share harder. Why aren't you sharing enough? Keep on sharing. And it worked really, really well. And they shared. And they continue to share. And sharing is their thing. That is like the Mashable way. We framed it that way. That was just like, that was a framing thing. Thank you for sharing some of your <laughs> secrets. <laughs> nice um, job. <laughs> so after, uh, let's say, we, we, we start reading your book, we finish reading it, uh, do we just get out there and, uh, you know, implement it? Or do we need to some other resources to engage with before we actually can implement all this uh, uh, smart uh, science into practice? I mean, with the book, it's a lot just... I think the knowledge gives you the baseline to be able to look in the world and look at a project and be like, how do I use these triggers on this project? Or just looking at maybe a story that's in the news and being able to say, I know why that's capturing my attention and why that's captivating the news. And I th that's what I've noticed uh, ever since like I finished the book. Just being able to automatically be able to go, oh, that's why that works and why, and that's what this company should do. And it just kind of comes down to a matter of, uh, like I literally just put the triggers down uh, on a, piece of paper and I look at something and I'm like, how can I uh, apply that knowledge and that science and those triggers to whatever I'm working on? What is the right one? There's obviously other, like I recommend lots of other materials. It helps. It kind of depends. You're probably more, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. So about half. Raise your hand if you're an investor. Raise your hand if you uh, work at one of the big tech companies here. Raise your hand if you have no job. Yeah, we got one. Yeah, no, you 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 don't bubble around. You have you have a job, um, <laughs> so like <laughs> I'm just like staring at you for a moment. Uh, so uh, a dominant fund. I understand that you teach your startups attention. Attention. Do you you teach them the same techniques, right? Or do you teach them something well, else? It's, well, we teach them we teach them our techniques, but it's also just all of like a, the reason initially writing the book was the entrepreneurs, you know. They wanted help with press, they wanted help with marketing on how to build a market strategy, customer news acquisition, virality, influencer relationships. Those are all attention. And we help them in all those areas and we help them uh by utilizing that knowledge, but also just, you know, part of the, like, it's, it's both. It's that knowledge, it's that scientific knowledge that I have now, and this is our real world, real world experience, doing this for, you know, a combination, our team for years and years and years. And that kind of combination, you know, that knowledge helped me do the book, and that book's helped me doing it now. It's kind of like a cyclical cycle. Okay, I see. Uh, and on your blog, you say that uh, you have the ability uh and their responsibility <laughs> to change the world for the better, unquote. Uh, and I wanted to ask what are some sectors maybe you're focusing on uh, with your startups that you, that you try to accomplish th this goal with? I mean, so that's literally a thing I decided in college was going to be my purpose in life. It's the corniest one, but I've kept with it uh, because it does guide, all my, it does guide all most of my decisions. And so in terms of what we're investing in, we like – we like to say we invest in the next generation of platforms. We that's what excites us. We think that's fascinating. You know, we've invested in, for example, like uh, we invest in a company called Ubi. They deliver wireless electricity over distance using ultrasound, and was founded by a 25-year-old female ex-NASA engineer. And what they're doing is literally going to make it easier than ever to power any device anywhere because you can walk into a room and your phone will just start charging because the it'll be Wi-Fi for power without any danger to the body. But we're in, like we're thinking about things like virtual reality, but not just like how do you use it for games, but how do you use it for medicine? How do you use it for real world interactions? How do you build like I was talking with one company building a medical platform um, or education platforms? Like it's to me, it's platforms, and uh, there's lots of sectors that fascinate and interest me in, the, in general. But it's really about are they building a platform where people can build on top of it? And can impact the widest amount, the widest amount of people possible, and you know I think the ones that are going to really help a lot of people in the next few years are going to be things like, uh, like like virtual reality and being able to interact with the world at another level is going to be things like energy and education, and 
in improving efficiency in areas like policy and uh, and information flow, especially to areas of the world that don't have it. And even things like food distribution, mm-hmm. things like that, that'll make all those things more efficient. Mm-hmm. Talking about the future, when is the next book coming out and what it's God going to be no. about? God no, God no. I still have nightmares about this one. Seriously, it's, I don't know if anyone's ever written a book here, anyone. Um, one, was it two? Was it painful? Yes, no. Yes, yes, it's painful. It was not painful for you? No. You didn't, you didn't try hard enough. <laughs> you dictated it. Uh, I, had, I, did, I did my own. I couldn't, I couldn't dictate it to anyone. I just couldn't do it. But the, that, that would be, yes, it's a bitch. But I couldn't, I couldn't, it was just, no. I, I Give me a couple of years to even think about it. I want to get through promoting this book and, talk, and sharing it with as many people as possible. And maybe there will be some point, it's kind of like a startup, where you shouldn't do a startup because you want to. You should do it because you have to. And I, I did do this book because I had to. Because no one was doing this, was not talking about this subject and giving that knowledge to others. And when I come across that again, then maybe I'll do another book. If I if, if there's a long enough time period between, you know, the me remembering the pain of doing this book. Yeah. It is it is the brain version of childbirth. That's a very good point. Maybe I didn't do my PhD thesis because I didn't need to. I now, consider, now I understand I consider it better the, yeah. and better. I consider this like my PhD thesis. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Maybe we should open it up to the questions from the audience. If you have questions. And introduce yourself, please. I want to know who you are and what you do. And uh, just a second. We'll need you to speak into the microphone so that people who are watching online uh, hear you as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvonne Gonzalez, and I work for Opera Software. We're like a few stories up here. Um, Is Opera in this building? It is in this building. Oh, cool. We're on the eighth floor. Oh, that's right. You have the giant like opera logo here. Yes, sir. <laughs> so my question to you is: You keep bringing up how hard you uh, said this book was to write. What was the hardest part about writing this book? Was it starting it? Was it outlining it? Was it getting the whole idea together of what you wanted to write the book about? <sighs> it was integrating the science with real world storytelling. That was the hardest part. And I literally wrote three chapters, and we scrapped all three chapters, and I started rewriting the whole thing again. And it's just because um, you got it. I had to first get the science, and I had to go through the science, and I had to discover the common threads in the science. And I had to go through real-world stories, and I had to go through the common threads between the two. Then I had to find the – then I had to go and – figure out the studies that applied to which stories and which stories applied to which stories and organize it in such a way that it would actually be readable and understandable and not a giant pie of liberty glock. Um, it, was, it was integrating the two together, honestly, that was really, really hard. I would go, th- like, it was also perfectionism being like, I want this to be perfect and absolutely right. And, you know, I would double check and triple check facts and I would go back to interviews and I'd call people and be like, "This is this a right interpretation? Is this a wrong interpretation?" And doing that over and over again just meant it was a slower process than, say, writing a fiction a, a fiction book. A fiction book's a little bit easier because the flow is simpler, and there's a little bit less research unless you're doing something really intensive like a historical book. So that would be my answer. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, I need your name and what you do. Uh, my name is Michael Moon, and I have an innovation think tank in Oakland. Awesome. Um, my question is, uh, did your interviews or research entail any of the uh, primary research uh, done by Walt Disney in creating the initial Disney characters? I talk a little bit about the Disney characters, um, but I, I actually tried to uh, – We it just that we, there were a couple interviews that didn't – I almost had and didn't work out. And, I almost had Eisner, but it didn't work out at the and I had He would have been an idiot anyway. Probably, but you know, I wanted to talk with the Disney team and Disney Innovation. Uh, I I the char- the thing about the characters like is like it, the he came the M- Mickey Mouse came up when I was doing the Mario stuff because the two most recognized worldwide characters are actually Mickey Mouse and Super Mario, funny enough. And there's like with the with you, you what, know, do you know that, that his team 
uh, actually put together a taxonomy of threat uh, <laughs> that will correspond a lot to your uh, uh, I did not know that. Antithesis. And he specifically engineered uh, uh, Mickey to be the antithesis of threat. He was the antithesis. You're right. He is the antithesis, antithesis of threat. And so his facets were large. The threats are large, big, fast, brightly colored, loud, hard-edged, and sharp. You need to read the second chapter because I talk a lot about that. Because there are, there are those things, right? I talk about, for example, uh, automatic color reactions, right? Because you, we have automatic reaction when we see the colors yellow and black. What do you think? Wasp, he, it's going to hurt really bad. Does anyone have some ointment? Uh, but you're right. In the Mickey has kind of the opposite. It's kind of a disruption in a way, you know? You don't have a character who's quite like that. Nowadays, every, every character has a little bit of that edge, right? It's also an adaptation. That was a kind of thing that was right for that era. And Mickey's still well-known, but Mickey's, and Mickey's the mascot, but you don't see, like, a Mickey movie recently. Not much, right? The movies are, what, what, are, what are the big franchises for Disney right now? They're, they're Pixar's. They're Pixar's. Fro well, Pixar's, Frozen, and Marvel, and Star Wars. I, I submit they lost, the, uh, they lost the recipe. You think they lost the recipe? I, well, maybe that specific recipe. I, I, I submit that the audience has changed and that the audience doesn't resonate with a Mickey as much as it may have used to. Like, certain characters adapt better over time than others. Sure. And Mickey's become a place where he's iconic, but it's not a place where you're going to watch a Mickey cartoon. And Disney, rightfully, smartly so, has not overused Mickey in their cartoons or in their movies or that sort of thing. That's why you don't suddenly have, like, Mickey, Mickey 16, Mickey Ghost. Like, it's not like the land, the land Before Time where they have, like, 18 episodes of that, of the dino little baby dinosaurs walking around trying to find things. Did you know they released a new one this year? They released a new one. There's, like, 16 of them. The greatest cash grab ever. I don't know who's – I don't know if there's still kids watching it, but they don't care, I guess. But, no, but what Disney's done really well, the company at least – is adapted to what their audience, what the audience wants. Like right now, the audience wants a little bit of that, that grit, and wants a little bit of that kind of like that deeper storyline than that a Mickey can provide. You can get that with a Luke Skywalker, and you can get that with a Tony Stark, and you can get that even with like an Elsa and Frozen. It's not your typical princess storyline. It's a much kind of deeper thing. It's much more female empowerment sort of thing. If you're not burned out on it, there's a article probably you'd have to go into the. Uh, uh, microfiche to get it. It probably came out about 25 years ago. And I think it was in the, the New West magazine. It was an interview with John Hench. Hench was one of uh, 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 Disney's 13 guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was the scholar and historian for that whole group. And so he shares in this uh, interview. Send that to me uh, if, you, if, you, if you have it. If you don't, I'll, I'll find it. I'll send you the, the reference to it. That's fine. But he describes uh, again how Disney commissioned a, a study on uh, what constitutes a threat. Because the initial uh, character that he put together scared the bejesus out of, out of the kids. Read chapter 1 and 2. Hi, my name is John Francisco, and uh, I'm a technology exec. And I was wondering, um, what was one of the most or the most interesting thing you discovered during your research of the book, for the book? I discovered a few things that I didn't truly know, like dopamine, for example. Everyone thinks dopamine is this thing in the brain that creates pleasure. It does not. And so I interviewed Dr. Kent Burge, who's the leading researcher in this area. And what he did was this experiment where he had lab rice, mice, and he took all the dopamine out of them. And he wanted to see what would happen to these mice when they took the dopamine out. And he found, first of all, that the mice could still feel pleasure even with no dopamine. You give it sugar water, it's going to still find it tasty. What he found was that it lost, they lost all motivation. And in fact, they lost so much motivation that they all died. They would rather die than be motivated to even eat. And so dopamine actually creates what they, he calls wanting. It creates a desire for reward, whether it is a, whether it is a drug you inject into your arm or it is a pile of food or it is to become the greatest piano master the universe has ever seen. And so dopamine creates wanting. And your job when it comes to attention is actually to create that wanting loop, that desire for something. And if people, and the association that we have with dopamine and pleasure should be thrown away. It's dopamine and motivation. 
And that was like one thing that really kind of surprised me. A lot of the color associations are just fascinating by how strong they were. You know, like a couple of little random ones, uh, not just color, but in general. If you give somebody a hot cup of coffee, the, uh, that person will, on average, rate that person as more likable. If you just give them a hot drink, if you, if you want to not be thrown into jail, you want to have the first slot in the day or the first slot after a judge has lunch because judges make more negative decisions later in the day. Ending up with the end of the day is usually the most negative of all decisions because they go through decision fatigue. And the more decision fatigue they have, the more they default to a negative response, which is, here, go to jail. Um, I'm thinking some of the interesting color ones. Like, more than 50% of a person's initial assessment of a brand comes entirely from color. Oh, here's another interesting one. The, if you show somebody uh, the IBM logo and you show somebody the Disney logo before they do a task, people – and th they had it study. And what they did was they – gave them a brick, and they said, you have three minutes to come up with as many uses for this brick as possible. That's literally what they did. And But before they would do that, they would be exposed to these logos. And if you expose them to the Disney logo, they would have about 30% more ideas for the brick than if you gave them the IBM logo. These subconscious associations matter. I know that's how anyone work at IBM. I like IBM, but that's kind of crazy, right? These little things really matter. If... A, a, if you're a schizophrenic, being put under a red light will actually make you more agitated. And if you put them under a blue light, a schizophrenic will become calmer. Crazy subconscious associations that we have, these crazy kind of heuristic responses that we have that people don't realize every day affects us. If you repeat a statement over and over again, uh, people will rate that as more true. And they had a study where they would just like say this as 20 statement, new statements and 20 of the same. And they do it every other week with these subjects. And they would rate them as more and more truthful. Despite the fact repeating a statement has no impact at all on whether I'm telling you the truth. But if you do it enough times, people will think it's the truth. It's just what it is. With bacon? <laughs> I just like putting random things on here. That's just my personality. I'm going to put random disruptive things. If, I co if it comes to my head, I might write it down. Nope, no prompt. Hi, my name is Martin Nomander, and I work for Google down the road here mm -hmm. in developer relations. Were there any things, uh, when you did the, uh, check the research, uh, were there any things that, um, uh, any myths you busted, or any things that are common knowledge? <laughs> any myths you <laughs> that, busted? Uh, you know, I That are common knowledge that aren't true, but that people talk about. Uh, I mean, I, I just mentioned one. I mentioned the dopamine one. A lot of people really believe that dopamine creates pleasure. Really does not. It creates liking. It's opioids that create pleasure. I did actually interview Grant Bahar of the Mythbusters for the book. That was a fascinating one. I ran into, uh, very side note, I ran into the, myth, the other two Mythbusters, Jamie and Adam, in studio. They were doing a thing for CNN. Adam was all, like, jumping around when I gave him the book. Anyway, that's a side note. Uh, like, a lot of the, the, lot of the things is that people... I, I think the biggest thing is that people feel like they have this enormous amount of control over their attention. And the honest truth is that over the short term, we don't. These, so a lot of things have automatic control over our attention. And I described a few of those things uh, just now in terms of the colors and the sights and the sensory sort of things. Um, another, well, like, and, like a lot of those are like these little myths of uh, how we behave. Like, for example, uh, one thing I learned is that if you put a McDonald's menu or any other fast food menu, if you put a salad on that menu, people will actually, on average, pick the less healthy option in, in, than if there was no salad at all. And that's because of this kind of mechanism where, in our brains that um, vicarious goal fulfillment. And what it means is that we feel like we fill – there's two goals. There's two kind of rewards we're going after when we're eating. One is a short-term, ooh, it's tasty. And one is a long-term, oh, I'm being healthy and I'm getting sexier. And the long – that's an ex intrinsic reward, that like healthier kind of thing. And it's an extrinsic reward, the oh, it's tasty. And so we're trying to actually get both most of the time. When you look at a McDonald's menu, you kind of – and you see a salad, we actually subconsciously – 
vicariously say, we fulfilled the goal of considering a healthy option, so I can eat the fries now. That is how our brains effing work. That's how we make decisions. Seriously. How are we supposed to get healthy if that's the fucking thing we do? But it is what we do. You know, at a just crazy subcon at a crazy subconscious level. Another one is that, um, and I talk a lot about this in the book, is just our huge amount of deference for experts. So people like, who do? You, one thing I learned that surprised me a little bit is that the number one most trusted spokesperson of a brand is an outside expert. Is not CEO. Is not a person like you. Is not a celebrity. It is always an expert. We care. We trust experts. And in fact, there's a study that found that our the decision making centers of our brain pretty much literally shut off when we're listening to an expert because we're kind of offloading our uh, brain processing power to that expert. And you know, it makes sense in the sense that if a doctor tells me I should take my medicine or I'll die, I should probably take my medicine or I'll die. But we, it also leads to things where we start paying attention to experts on, on television shows that we probably shouldn't be paying attention to. And the reason is this thing, directed deference, is this kind of crazy is this like crazy phenomenon where we just shut off our brains when we listen to experts. I mean, those are just like, a, like there's a lot of like little surprising things I found overall. The last thing I would think is that I, I don't personally think that attention, that uh, technology is like making our brains like less attentive or dumber. I think what is happening is that our attention is the exact same and it's just adapting to the environment in the sense that our attention is always like scanned for like 50 different things when we were hunter-gatherers because we were looking for threats. We still do the same thing, but there are no threats. At least there's no like pterodactyls going to come through the window and like eat us. That'd be cool. I hope it eats none of you, but it'd still be cool. But instead, we've replaced that with a different type of novel information. It's called smartphone notifications. And the reason they capture our attention is because they, we look for new and novel information automatically. Smartphone notifications, emails, texts, they are that thing. They are replacing saber-toothed tigers and, well, not pterodactyls, because humans never live with pterodactyls, but you get the idea. Up here. So, Ben, um, today... You have uh, to introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, my name is P.K. Gulati. I'm here from Dubai. I, I, must, I'm, I don't have a job. <laughs> you, he has a job. I know this man. Uh, his job, you, we don't know what his job is, but he has a job. <laughs> so the question is, like, you've written a book which has done, uh, you've done a lot of homework with, you've done a lot of research. It's a book based on a lot of science. But then if you go down to a bookshop and look at the, you know, the aisles, they are full of a lot of fluff. You know, books with titles like this. How do you plan to stand out? Like, how many, well, how would you emphasize or tell people the amount of, you know, real research that's gone into it? My eventual long-term goal is not to have to be me to tell everyone. I'm already doing a lot of that in TV interviews and events like this. It's word of mouth. It's people reading the book and being like, it's great and fascinating and I should be spreading this to others um, and telling more people. In the long term, that's, what, that's the only way a book actually spreads is the word of mouth and people being like, it was a great book and I should go and share it. And in the end, it's about that content and it's about the strength of that content. And I'm, I'm betting all my chips on the strength of that content. That said, that said, I have a couple plans for standing out that are not quite launched yet, but are launching very soon. Yeah, I would bet on that knowing you. Uh, <laughs> the question that I have, when do you have the digital version out there? The digital version? Yeah, the Kindle's already out. The Kindle ver there's the Kindle version. There's the audiobook version if you want the audiobook version. It had a great, uh, had a great narrator audio narrate the audio version. So it's whole not available worldwide. Though. No, it, it's it's available in it's available in most in U.S., Canada, and a few other countries. Uh, I don't know, but I mean it's it's English, so I would I have to go look and see if it's available in India or not. But there's a bunch of other translations that are coming out, but that's different than the Indian version. Translations in uh, what, uh, what I languages? can't I can't say where the translations are. I'm not allowed to say, okay. but it's over a dozen that are okay. going to be coming out. Hi, my name is Maria. I work at House in um, online product and content marketing, and so I'm looking at. Is there any research uh, you came across as you were um, putting the book together on what gets people to click? On what gets people to click? Uh, the thing I talked about in clicking is really kind of. It's a couple things. One is just actually noticing the buttons, and that's contrast, and that's the automaticity trigger. And that really is the level contrast a button has with its surroundings. 
you can't, and it's how much competition does it have? If you have like 15 buttons, they're going to click zero buttons. You want to have like one to two maximum uh, user flows that you want your users to go through. And it should be very clear what button they should click to go through that user flow. If you want to buy something, that color better really stand out against that gray or white or black background. And those are almost always typically oranges and yellows and maybe even bright neons or greens. And those, I, I read, like, any of those kind of colors will work for, like, a website button and getting people to click. Um, the actual text matters a little bit less, but the shorter text is better because people don't have, when you give them too much information, they go through cognitive overload and they start having issues with uh, attention fatigue and they start, when you give them more options for decisions, people make less decisions. And so give them less options, seriously, less options. You want to make it like one to two or three options tops and then the rest of it is kind of just going through the straight flow. You know, it can, like if I'm on a shopping website, maybe I'd rather be like, here's the set for your day out in the beach. I don't know. Rather than I have to go pick all the individual items. It's much easier when you don't have to pick everything. It's much easier when there's not eight buttons to pick, but two. Less decision making. In the corner, and then you've asked one, we'll get another. Oh. Over there. Hey, Ben. My name is Justin Keltner. I'm uh, from the Bay Area, and I am a real estate and marketing entrepreneur and investor. Uh, question I had from you, uh, for you is, first of all, who do you think is like the main, uh, the main audience that Captivology is for in terms of like an industry or, or a group? Is there one particular like niche that it speaks to? And then maybe kind of on that note, are you planning on taking this, uh, and if you haven't already, like building some type of uh, platform or like tr uh, more in-depth training around it like a lot of other authors are doing like what's kind of the next the next steps for Captivology itself I'm just really curious uh, I have I haven't thought too much about what the next step of Captivology is quite yet I really do enjoy the investing and I want to keep applying that knowledge to my startups um, what was the first question again like who who the target who, is it for is who I mean it's it's or? it's I, I applied it broadly like business like business it's business you know is the first audience is uh, is marketing execs is entrepreneurs is it's uh, advertising it's sales it's anyone who's in a business that uh, where attention is a necessary component of their job but obviously I wrote it I really wrote it to be widely applicable across all these audiences now as for what I'm going to do with it next. I've thought about some of those things. And you get interest in random offers and opportunities in your inbox. Uh, it's all, My thing's always going to, I think, be investing for a long time. But as for exactly what I'm going to do with it, I don't know yet. I, I could do workshops. I might. I've been asked to do that. I'm not 100% certain which path I'm going to take. Right now, it's just kind of I want to go and talk with as many people as possible and get as many ideas and do some interesting things. And the more people I talk to, the more these ideas kind of crystallize. One there. How my, much time I do we have left? My second question. Oh. Okay. My second question is: uh, if you if you're an entrepreneur uh, and we're setting out to build a uh, a fan base around uh, your value proposition, your business. Uh, tools, whatever you're selling. Uh, how would we apply uh, the principle, your uh, seven triggers and three phases? To like building a product? Building a fan base. To building a fan base. So you always start with how do you walk your audience to the three stages of attention? How do you get their immediate and short attention? So you have to get the attention of this fan base first, right? Is what is that disruptive thing that makes you, your fan, that your community or what you're trying to build different than everybody else. Why does it stand out? It has to stand out. And you have to figure out how to make it stand out and show people that it stands out. And then I kind of just like, I'm like thinking through like the kind of triggers. It's also really, in the end when it comes to community, it's, you know, it's a combination of rewarding them for being part of that community. And one thing I talk about, and I haven't talked about this quite enough in rewards, is um, 
most people use incentives as their rewards. It's if you do this, I give you this. Least effective type. Terrible. That's another like random one I've learned. Is most like much more effective, for example, post action rewards. Is surprising people with a reward. And so they had a study where they would spray either water or citrus into people's mouths, and they found that when they could, when they, when the subjects could not predict the pattern, the pattern was random. They felt the most amount of delight, and they paid the most attention to the task, and they were overall happier. And so, rather than being like, "Here, you do this, I give you this." Someone just maybe doing an action you want them in your community, and then afterwards surprising them with a with a gift or a thank you note or just something will make them will make them more likely to come back and make them more likely to remember you and make them more likely to care. And but really in the end, it's acknowledgement when it comes to fan bases. It's providing the tools and it's you as the whatever the entity providing validation for your fans and for them being a part of your community and them care, them caring and providing acknowledgement, but also letting them provide acknowledgement to each other and support each other and build that. It's part of the reason why, you know, Facebook and Twitter do so well is because you provide, you get constant validation in the forms of likes, retweets, favorites. That kind of thing boosts us and makes us pay attention because we're looking for that on a constant basis. And you can get that validation on those kind of social networks, but you can also get it in that fan base. And it really just depends on like what is that niche? Niche? How do you like? How does that stand out versus that whatever it is stand out against the rest? And then how and how often and how much are you providing that real validation and that acknowledgement to your audience? And how do you make it so that their your audience can do it with each other and help each other and to a point where they're just sticking around because they're always finding help and they're always finding community there. I think I saw, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Uh, my name is Robert Cassard. I'm a video content consultant. I've been doing video for a long time and helping companies essentially growth hack by using video. And uh, I have a question for you about personalization because something that we've done a lot of is in the distribution process when we send videos out, we're finding that a little bit of personalization is really powerful and encourages click-throughs and makes people watch longer and all that. I was curious if personalization factored into what your research is about and if you discovered anything about it. Again, acknowledgement. is that That's an instant acknowledgement of, I cared enough to personalize this video, even in a very small and slight way, for you and acknowledge that you mattered enough to do this. That's a big deal to somebody. That again, acknowledgement is the most powerful of all of the seven triggers. It provides the longest and strongest form of attention. And so that personalization is providing that. It also is a frame. Of, it's a framing effect. Is um, you're framing this message for your audience by even just saying their name or uh, or making sure that it, their interests. You know what their interests are. You know, I'm going to watch a video that's aligned with my interests versus one that's not. And so if you give somebody a package that includes, you know, that video videos that align to their interests or even just acknowledges them, they're going to pay attention more because that's where we are in a frame of reference where that's what we pay attention to. So that works really well. Yeah, we, we found that as an example, and this one even surprised me, we sent out a campaign and it didn't have any personalization on it and no one clicked through to watch a video. And when we added a Dear Ben, to it, just a simple Dear Ben, all of a sudden there were hundreds more click-throughs. And it even shocked us that it would be that big a difference between those two. So I was just curious if you know your research supported that, which obviously it does. Yeah, it's also the disruptive nature. People don't usually do that. When that happens, they're surprised. Surprise is very powerful in our attention as well. Surprise, it's shown that surprise in general is just something that records better in our memory and provides us with more positive feedback. Thank you. Awesome. Maybe one or two more. I wonder what is more powerful, surprise or suspense and mystery, if you compare the two, if you can compare them. Well, they're, 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 to me, they're kind of like the same. Like they're, two, they're, they're, nece they're both necessary. Uh, so the research shows that, oh, I wish I should have the video next time. The, the, the research shows that we, uh, it, there's a, there was research that went through ads and found that ads that had more moment-to-moment -moment suspense uh, were more captivating and were better remembered by their audiences. And what I mean by moment to moment suspense is most people can predict the end of most storylines, you know? Like, you, you, you know, for example, Budweiser had a great commercial this year where they had a puppy.
that was trying to get back home, and you had the suspense of, how is the puppy going to escape the wolves? And you know the puppy's going to survive. They're not nationwide. They're not going to kill the puppy. <laughs> See association there. Um, they're not going to kill the puppy, but the moment-to-moment -moment suspense made it one of the top ads of that year. Um, but it's also the surprise. It's just surprise, positive surprises really do captivate us. And we are tuned for it because of the threat assessment. But when it's positive, we feel really positive about most people in general. Um, the, but, you know, a surprise, like a cliffhanger is the kind of, like, can be a surprise, and the mystery can be a surprise, and the twist ending. All those things really, really like, all come together for... Yeah, they do come together. Yeah, you, like, I talk about those are key elements of creating a great mystery. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, oh. hi, this is Grace from Tryon Apps, yeah, uh, a local startup company. So I want to see that uh, what's your res uh, research result? Uh, um, so originally, people only have, uh, consumers only have newspapers to read and then local stores. And uh, with the uh, invention of the internet, they can actually look, uh, look through all the products on the internet. Now with the global economy and with the old apps, they have more uh, ideas, more concepts, and uh, more products to look at. So um, with this trend yeah, from your research, yeah, what are the going to be the uh, determining elements for the consumer to make the purchase? And then what are the decision, uh, what are the decision points they make when they make the purchase? When they make a purchase? I mean, the first part you were talking about was kind of just uh, the common trend, which is there's more information than ever, right? Is that, you know, 90% of the world's information has been created in the last three years. And by in, in, in 18, 1986, we were exposed to approximately 46 newspapers worth of information daily from advertisements and such. Today, it's seven full DVDs worth of information on a daily basis. Kind of a difference, right? And so, um, I mean, the decision point really kind of just comes down to like there's, it, it really comes down, it depends on the consumer, you know? It depends on what their frame of reference is. But really the common threads are is how simple is it to make the decision? How quickly can you make the decision? And like, because if I have to go through 18 steps in order to do something, I'm not going to go through with it. Or if I have to make a lot of decisions in order to buy your product, you know? Like, there is such a thing as too much customization. Or at the very least, making it so customization is a necessity to get a product. I'd rather have, like, a stand... You'd, most people would rather have, like, three standard options. And then if someone really wants to customize, that's, like, a side thing that they can do. And that's for, like, a more niche audience. But for a straight audience, they want a simple decision. They want to be able to get their thing quick. I, I Like, there's a lot of factors that go into that decision. It's really mostly a matter of who gets their attention first, you know? Is when you do that search... Almost always, it's the thing that's on the first page of results. It's the thing that got to the that got the top. One of the reasons I also talk about, for example, like in ratings, you know, when they have and Amazon has number one bestseller in X, that's actually a attention effect. That's a, the reputation trigger in the sense that we re, we trust the crowd, and the research shows that we trust the decisions of the crowd because, especially for decisions on things like what's popular, what to buy, or what's quality. Because actually, in general, the crowd is right more often than it is wrong on that area. And so those ratings really do matter, and the amount of those ratings and, you know, that little sign that says it's a bestseller, those things do factor in to our attention. Like, we don't make a ton of crazy decisions when making purchases. You know, we are we're only considering the first few things that are in front of us. And then after it, it's really about what are our needs. So you want to get their initial attention first. Once you have that, then you're already halfway through the game. Um, also, I just want to say, also a wildcat. But um, I what year? Um, I'm not saying. Ah, oh, <laughs> what school? We'll talk Medill. Medill. And All I right. was at an event last week. It was the marketing um, program event, and we were talking about how at work, you know, your boss says, "Okay, do this project," and I want it or video, and I want it to go viral. And you're like, "Okay, get right on that." Um, so, can you give us some tips from your research for the book about how you do, kind of, what are the things that characterize something that goes viral that for for virality oh. virality is sometimes a hard thing to predict and um, there's another good book contagious that um, and I've talked to Jonah Berger about this yeah and I've talked to Jonah a bunch about this and you know the for me when it comes to virality the, there's a couple key factors 
disruption is probably the number one key factor. The, what that kind of thing that violates people's expectations where they have to turn and pay attention to it. But it's also maybe something where um, it's also that fear of missing out where once something starts going, you really want to be part of one side or the other. I think about that goddamn dress a few weeks ago. <laughs> and there's a couple factors that made it go, uh, popular, and I actually did the blog post about it. One is that we shouldn't be arguing about the color of a goddamn dress. That makes no sense. So that captures your initial tension. Then it's the picking of sides, and that's an identity thing. And being able to identify I'm on team black and blue, or I'm on team gold and white, or I'm on team fuck you all. One of those three teams. And then it like it just kind of like it comes down to kind of those I think those kind of key factors of uh, what's well, why is this disruptive and violating the expectations? What's different about this? This little thing, you know, it's like this is not supposed to normally happen. And then maybe people being able to have an identity with it or pick a side on it or something like that. Um, and then you know, so the little bit of the mystery as well, like the blue, the dress kind of was like, what color is it actually? There had to be a resolution so people paid attention to it, or, you know, um, in a negative version, the Justine Sacco saga, when, just when that gal went before she got on the plane, tweeted about how she was, I hope I don't, I'm going to Africa, I hope don't get AIDS. Oh no, oh wait, I'm white, and you know, the reason why that went viral is because she went on a plane and she couldn't respond for ten hours, and then the mystery built up of how is she going to respond? Is she going to keep her job? And you do that for ten hours, of course it's going to go viral because the mystery gap is not closed. And those are just like a couple little things. It's not always. It's not exactly. There's no such thing as true predictability of viral elements, but those kind of key things really capture attention. Is that is that mystery storyline? Is that disruptive nature? And is that identity aspect? Any further questions? That's a lot of questions. Oh, let's do the two more. And then we can all have drinks and maybe party. Thanks. We'll have to. <laughs> so my name is Dale Kern, and I work at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, where I do what I call eyeball PR. And I have found that you know today s we have a lot of focus on visual storytelling. But if you've ever watched cataract surgery, it's not really something you want to promote, except for the people who like the really squeegee stuff. So I'm wondering if in your research you saw anything that provided good alternatives to that kind of having the visual element because eyeballs are kind of gross. Is, is your goal to get more people to get ca surgery? What's your goal? It does uh, decrease mortality by 40%. Is that, but so is that specific goal? Um, no, I mean, I, we do all sorts of any eye stuff. But what we find is that most of the pictures that can go with that to kind of describe and especially educate the public about. Well, so here, here's the thing I'm thinking about, and let me under, let me s see if this comes even close to what you're trying to go. So there's a so this, there's a thing I talk about in the book called the identifiable victim effect. And so they had a study a few years ago, and what happened was there is the researchers gave a bunch of students an unrelated task, and at the end they would give them an envelope, and it would have um, a note. And they would offer you could uh, donate up to five dollars to this save the children type charity, right? Story one was the statistics about uh, about starvation in Zambia and how you know eighty nine million people are starving and all this kind of issue, and your money would go towards that. And then the other story was the story of Rokia, this girl who they lives in Zambia who can't get an education because she has to uh, go fetch water and barely can eat, and your money will go directly to help her. Guess which version got a lot more donations by nearly 4x. And it's because we can't identify with statistics. We identify with individuals and individual stories. Um, I think about what Charity Water does. When they when you donate to a well, it's not just you donate it to a well, but they tell you the story of that well. They You donate to a specific well, and then they send you specific stories of that well being built and how that the people that it's impacting and how it impacts. And so it would be less to me like, which put up pictures of eyeballs and more like the kind of impact it's making. And, you know, like if I was doing a video, it wouldn't be here's the surgery. It would be how this person could suddenly see the world and can suddenly do things he or she could never have done before. That's the compelling story. And you can, that, there's a visual way to tell that story. I mean, this is not just about like stock photos of eyeballs going like this. It's about... It's about what is the actual impact of what you're doing, and when you can show that story, especially of an individual, of an individual you can go through the story of, it's much more powerful. 
Is anyone else thinking about eyeballs right now? Because I am. It's not a good thought. You're right. Eyeballs are, uh, uh, eyeballs are not sexy. Eyes are sexy, but eyeballs are not. All right, well, last one. Last question. All right, so the cover of the book caught my attention when I saw it in the email. Uh, why is that? Is it physical threat? Is it uh, something else going on there? Uh, there was, a, as you could imagine, there was a lot of decision making around the cover and thoughts about it. It's a combination of this does not normally happen. That violates people's expectations. I already told you why I picked blue and teal. Partly because it has the correlation with competence, but also because there are not a lot, there are very few covers that have that color on it at all. And that's why you also kind of see the high contrast and why there's just a little dab of red rather than a big thing red. Even though, you know, if there's a big thing of red, I might like be on 50 more dates than I normally would have been. Um, it really, like, those are the, like the two things that really came down. It came down what's going to capture immediate attention, enough for people to look and look in the back of the book and the inside flap and be like, this is interesting, I should look into it further. I mean, I was going to say, I hope my face is not like trying to threaten you, but I guess, I guess that's one not way to all. do it. If, if, that, if that's the way it's getting attention, then fine. I should put like vampire teeth next time. It looks a little scary. Why didn't I put vampire teeth? That would have been good. Next book. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ben, very much for being our guest. It's been a lot of fun. Good luck. Thank uh, you. And thank you, everyone, for coming out. <laughs> and please stay for a little bit longer. And if you have a book, I'll sign it. After I stick this thing off. the world.